from uh, Amatologica Vidcast that we produce. And you are? Um, I'm Luke. Um, I'm uh, one of the members of the Melbourne Hackerspace um, and one of, kind of partially one of the organisers of today. Um, yep. it's, um, it's been a really good day so far, really successful, lots of people, actually more people than we ever originally anticipated, but it's all been really fun. In indeed. I, I was told that it was Bedlam before. Uh, earlier today, lots and lots of people actually were, uh, came early. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but uh, now, even now though, it's still very, very busy. Um, uh, so I presume we're going to see this next year and the year after. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm going to commit to that at this stage, <laughs> but maybe. Um, I'm sure it'll be really good. Well, look, it looks terrific, and uh, the variety of different uh, things that I've seen here is just amazing. I mean, uh, I could easily spend a day, a whole day or two, <coughs> looking at all the different projects that people are doing. Yeah, definitely. There's a wide variety of different things, diverse things, but it's all really interesting stuff. Yep, no worries. Okay, well, nice to meet you, Luke, and uh, th you know, thanks again for putting this on. Thanks. Um, you're welcome. Okay. Have, a, have a great day. Oh, Checking yeah. everything out. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Like Catch you later. <laughs> Peter, uh, Peter. Look, it's oh, how Peter. are you, Peter? Yes, hello. It's Peter BK3YE. How are you going, Peter? Good, thanks, Peter. Uh, and uh, well, I see you've turned up here for the uh, the makeup there. This what is called interview by ambush, is it? Interview by ambush, yeah, for Amber Logic. Uh, this will end up probably as an amateur logic extra. Or an maybe amateur logic extra. Well, have I got a thing for you? But anyway, we better well, talk about the show. Show and tell. Let's yeah, uh, we, we better talk about the show first. We're at Maker Fair in Melbourne. Oh, no, um, I've got plenty of me, plenty mini Maker Fair. It's the first ever show, yeah. and it's and it's great. Lots of people, lots of people doing funny things with electronics, wrecking it, building new stuff out of it, yeah. doing all sorts of things that uh, you'd never thought could be done with it. Absolutely. I'm blown away by the variety of things that are here. And did you see the remote control blimp thing flying around? No. Oh, well, you'll have a treat. It's in, in the next room there. Or remote control. I think it's got a camera with it, so yep. it could, well, I'll it's have probably connected to Wi-Fi or something. Yeah. Now, uh, you would be, I don't know if you're aware, but I built one of your regenerative uh, radios. Really? Which one? This is the uh, single valve. I think it was a 12 au oh, oh, yes, that's right. And uh, So I built that mm. for one of, uh, and it worked, worked a treat, which is great. Now, uh, in case people aren't aware, of course, you actually have a series of videos on YouTube where you build lots of stuff, basically, and go out and... That's do right, operate radio. portable. Mm. Yep, so uh, uh, so they can search on what, VK3YE? VK3YE into YouTube and they'll find it. Okay, right. Well, come on, tell us. Tell All right. tell. Okay, well, you might have seen... Um, you might have seen this on one of the YouTube videos, but this is actually a small QRP transceiver for 40 metres. Wow. It's CW, puts out about 100, 200 milliwatts. As you can see, it's just powered by energizer batteries, mm -hmm. six volts, and it's built in, in a, uh, a common food container you can get from the supermarket, and it's great for building this sort of stuff. Wow. Um, we'll even take it out of the box. Here's a little Morse key, which yep. I'll show. And it does receive as well? It you? does receive as well. It is a transceiver, so you can switch from receive to transmit. That's the on button. Plug your antenna in there, or a little antenna coupler. Mm -hmm. And your crystal earpiece, like the old earpiece that people yep. use with crystal sets, um, just plugs into here. Now, inside, it's really easy to get at if you want to service it. Mm -hmm. um, at the centre is the tuning capacitor. Here you'll find two crystals for 7030 megahertz. Yep. reason why it's two is it increases the frequency pulling range. Yep. Now a lot of people build crystal controlled rigs and they're very limited because they're usually on the one frequency. Well with this one you can go all the way from 7005 to 7028. Okay. So over 20 kilohertz swing yep. which is most of the CW end of the band. Okay and what do you use for an antenna with this? For an antenna usually an N-fed wire about 20 meters long now that's high impedance, so you do need an L-match antenna coupler, but I've got a little one that plugs into here. Um, inside, uh, you've got VXO, which is one of the transistors here. Then you've got another transistor, that's the VXO just here. Um, you've got RF chokes in series, which allow your frequency shift to be increased. Yep. Another transistor underneath all that is the buffer. Here's our final transistor, a 2 mm -hmm. 53 and that goes right to the, that's the transmit receive switch. And in here, it's all very small, but a very simple receiver. Yep. Um, you did a great job on the soldering. It oh, well, very difficult. Well, thanks. That's another thing we've got here. We've got soldering workshops just down on the stage there. Yep. Um, the receiver is just an NE602. 
and that drives a BC548, which is enough to drive a crystal earpiece. So, and, and of course, it looks like you've, uh, I think, th is this an example of paddy boarding? Yes, it is. Paddy board, ugly construction, Manhattan style. It goes by various names, but if you're lazy like me and don't want to do a circuit board, then this is the way to go. Okay, yeah, I hope to do something on paddy boarding in the, in the very near future. Uh, okay, well, look, uh, thanks for that. Thanks, I just want one, one final yep. uh, question. What's the furthest you've gotten with that 200 milliwatts? Furthest, I've worked into VK2 and VK5, which for overseas listeners is around 600 to 800 kilometres. Uh, that's, uh, that's pretty good. I wonder whether, um, you know, with a resonant antenna properly set up, maybe even directional, you could get a little bit further than that. Probably. It, uh, but Possibly. That, although that, that would defeat the purpose, though, because it's really meant to be a portable type uh, operation, yeah, of course. Yeah. With, with the resonant antenna, like a dipole, you've got the coax feed, feed line you have to carry. And the idea of this was for a rig that could be fitted into a pocket. Yep. Um, I've got the antenna coupler, the um, another wire for the ground, and uh, a little field strength meter. That's in another one like that. So that's up to two pockets. And yep. then all you've got is a reel of wire about this big, which about 20 metres of wire, that fits into another pocket. Yep. So that's your complete station, apart from the squid pole, of course. Yep, it does. And um, the, uh, uh, did you get the design of that? Did you make that yourself, or did you actually get that off a website somewhere? Um, pretty much copied from bits of various other designs. Um, it just grew together like it's a uh, culprits oscillator, just a standard buffer and a um, final. I just basically put together what worked. Yep. Okay, thanks so much, Peter. Thanks, Peter. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, okay, 73s. Yeah. Cheers. Hi, I'm from a podcast called Amateur Logic. So, uh, get you up here. Hi, uh, I'm Peter, and you're Nicole. Hi, Nicole. There you go. Um, Good thing. Look, uh, what's it all about? Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're uh, displaying here. Um, so, I'm from an organisation called Robo Girls, yeah. and we're a student-run volunteer organisation to promote females in engineering. Oh, that's a cool idea. So, what we do is. We go out to primary schools and high schools across Victoria mm -hmm. and we teach the girls in the primary schools and um, high schools how to use these NXT robots. So we run robotic sessions for them, teach them a little about what engineering is, um, the, the prospect of females going into the field of engineering and also just letting them have a play around and having a bit of program about what the robot is and what it does. Okay, what, uh, what's the basis for the robot? Is it using Arduinos or...? Uh... Um, on the, the programming, yeah. it's from a, it's the, cause these are Lego NXT robots, yep. and it's through the program, it's called Mindstorms, okay. so it's a program that comes with the robot itself. Okay, so those, uh, are they uh, bought as kits, or as... Uh... Yes, they're, you, they're all together bought as a kit, you get the robot, all the parts, and the software program that goes on the computer. And if you don't mind me asking, what would that typically cost? Um, it would usually cost about $400. $400, for all a right. kit. And uh, are many schools using them? There's a few schools that have bought them themselves and are actually using them. And yeah, we have our own kit as Robo Girls and we take them around to schools and let them use ours. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much. No problem at all. Yeah, nice day. You too. Hi, oh, g'day. Hi, I'm from a podcast called Amateur Logic. Yes, and, uh, my name is Peter. Uh, what, uh, tell us a little bit about what uh, what you've got here. Uh, what's, uh, what's all on the table? Oh. Yeah, hi Peter. I'm Jonathan. Um, we're from Freetronics. We're a company that designs and manufactures open hardware. Yep. Um, most of our products are based on the Arduino line. So yep. we have a number of boards that are compatible with Arduino. Yep. Uh, for example, there is an 11 somewhere around here. Uh, we've got so much stuff, I can't find it. Um, which is equivalent to an Arduino Uno. Yep. But we also have a whole lot of variations, our own you know, ideas and twists and takes on it. Uh, for example, we have a board here called the Ether 10, which is like an Arduino with, it's basically an Arduino with built-in Ethernet. Uh -huh. uh, so it means you can have a single board instead of having to put a shield on top. So it means that you can build projects that connect to the internet just using one very simple board. 
Okay, that's cool. That'd be um, great if you wanted to remotely operate a piece of equipment in your home, I imagine. Yeah, that's right. Something like that. Yeah, what so about... I have a bunch of these inside the walls of my house. In fact, my entire house has been uh, rewired. Yep. Um, we've just done some big renovations on it, and in the process, we ripped out all of the existing wiring, yep. and every item in the house has been wired back to one of three switchboards. And um, inside the switchboard, there is a little Ether 10 uh, with uh, a network connection on it. Yep. And uh, output controllers. So there is there are no light switches in the house that actually switch any power. Yep. Each light switch is just a control surface mm -hmm. with an Ether 10 behind it, which yep. is a network enabled Arduino with um, Ethernet. Right. And it's all running on power over Ethernet. Just out of interest, would an Arduino be sufficiently powerful to uh, run a media server? Not as a media server in terms of, pro certainly not in terms of processing any media. Yep. In terms of logical control, um, it could be useful. In mm -hmm. fact, I used an Arduino um, a little while ago for uh, for a remote control. I integrated it with a Myth TV machine. So what I did was use some sensors on the Arduino to, um, to detect different events and then open Telnet connections to the Myth TV box and mm -hmm. send events to tell it to play or pause or whatever. Oh, okay. Um, okay, and uh, if people are interested in finding out more about your products, what's your website? Yep. Freetronics.com. Oh, uh, .au? Just .com. Just .com. No, we're, we're based in Melbourne, but we just haven't... In fact, I think we do have freetronics.com.au, but yeah. freetronics.com is our main site. Okay, look, anyway, thanks so much. Nice Thank to meet you. you. Okay, nice cheers, you. bye. Hello, um, I'm Peter from uh, a podcast called Amateur Logic. Um, what have we got here? Is this a MakerBot or? Uh... Um, yeah, this is a MakerBot. This is actually just our MakerBot we brought along um, yep. that we put together. Looks a bit and more sturdy than the usual MakerBots well, I've seen. This one's not made out of wood. <laughs> oh, and actually, um, what happened is I didn't really fancy the look of the um, the wood ones. Yeah. So I spray painted this. This is actually the same MakerBot that, that oh, you okay. saw over there. Yep. I got automotive. Um, metallic silver paint yep. and um, and this metallic blue paint and mm -hmm. sprayed all the parts before assembling it so it really looked more like a machine. I was watching um, a, a video, I think it was with uh, an interview on Twit TV with Bree Pettis oh, yeah. and uh, he was um, showing off his new uh, version of the MakerBot, um, I forget the name of it but it's uh, this is the earlier version. This is the very first generation, this one's like number 130 or so. Yep. And uh, of course, this has got a single extruder. Yes. And what plastic are you using? Uh, black ABS. Black ABS. And what sort of things can you show us that you might have made with it? Uh, uh, I don't have an awful lot here today, but we've got um, yeah, two cups and. Mm -hmm. That's quite good. Okay. And uh, when you produce, uh, let's say on larger objects, how smooth can you get the surface of the object to be? Or do you need to polish it afterwards? You either need to fill it. Uh, fill it and sand it, yep. or polish it afterwards. The um, mm -hmm. the later, some of the later MakerBots and another website called MakerGear. Yep. Um, dot com. They um, they've come a long way since this generation one machine, and they're down to like um, a fraction of a millimeter yep. extrusion nozzles now. Basically, the roughness is proportional to the thickness of your extruder nozzle. Okay, and uh, are these uh, these kits still available? Are these particular ones? Oh yeah, yeah, you can order them online. Okay, and what do they typically sell for? Uh, this one was about a thousand dollars for the kit, and this is a complete kit, and you put it all together. Okay, and uh, was it a difficult kit to assemble? No, not at all. Um, no, probably. It basically took the best part of a day. To oh, it's that all? It. Okay. Yeah. Right. Not so and uh, obviously all the, uh, the electronics on the side here. Yeah. What's this, Arduino powered? Or? It is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that all comes pre-assembled yeah, and does, uh, yeah. so you don't have to solder very much? Um, in fact, I don't think you have to solder anything. Uh, no, this, you don't have to solder anything for this. Okay, so uh, it's pretty much plug and play then. Yeah. Okay, well, nice to meet you. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Okay, Thanks. catch you later.
My goodness, copious amounts of cardboard here for reasons unknown. Hey, Peter. I'm oh, very well, thank you. Uh, it's good. Uh, you've, I see you've come to the Maker Fair here. Yes, I certainly have, yeah. Okay, what do you think so far? Oh, very interesting. I hope it catches on and they have one every year. Oh, look, it's, it's terrific. And the yeah. uh, turnout's great. And, yes. Uh, yep. and I've, I've met a whole lot of people I know, including Peter Parker, who was over there before. And, I saw uh, Peter. I'll have to see a load of people a little bit later. and a few other people, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's great. And um, how's the museum going anyway? It's coming along. I'm supposed to retire in February, yep. but looks like I may be getting a two-year age extension. Oh, that's good. So I may be there for another two years. That'd be great. And uh, yeah, was there some talk about extending the museum? I think. Yeah. This is we, the what's only a um, signals museum. Signals yes. Museum yeah. that we covered earlier in animal logic. We've completely emptied the back of the museum. We're in readiness for all the paint to be removed, but there's a hiccup because they uh, got quotes. Yep. They went for a gold-plated job. I got a, some really cheap quotes last year. Mm -hmm. And the gold-plated job is about four times as much as the quote was last year, so we're back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. We try and force them to get the cheaper tender of a go and have another go. So hopefully, yep. it may happen in the next two years. Oh, terrific. Okay, good to see you again. And yeah. we'll say hello to you Thank a little you, bit Peter. later. Okay, yeah, no, it's cheers. Cheers. Uh, hello, Peter from a uh, podcast called Abbott Logic. Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you've got here. Um, this is basically about upcycling. I'm mainly looking at steampunk upcycling, but upcycling yeah. works for anybody. It's taking waste and seeing the creative potential in it, so reusing waste things. So old computer cases yeah. to make shelves. Okay. Old bits of junk you get off the side of the street or from a junk shop and making kids toys like a ray gun. Okay. Or uh, this is going to be a desk lamp on my desk. Uh, once I cover it with something, basically taking lots of old things and using it in creative new ways. Okay, so show us a couple of examples. What's this thing over here? This, this thing's completely whimsical. It just looks fun on a coffee table. It doesn't actually do anything, but it's called a prebaric heteroscope. In theory, it detects lies. So you can tell I'm telling the truth because when I say I'm telling the truth, I turn it on. If it doesn't flash red, it means I'm telling the truth. So you're not lying. <laughs> Cool idea. I love the valves at the top as well. Yeah, well. Yep. And this case here. Is that, that's good. that's just there to sit so someone can think of what they, what could they use this old box for. Okay. And over here. These are the parts that are going to go on this. Uh, it's going to look like an airship, so it'll be a light, mm -hmm. a brass light fitting, and painted up and look like an airship. It'll yep. be on my desk lamp, basically. Yeah, you know, once upon a time, kids used to do this themselves. They'd go and get some old junk they or would. whatever, they and would. they'd use their imagination, and uh, lo and behold, they'd, uh, they'd come up with some uh, great toys that they'd uh, yep. play with. But now it's off to the toy shop, or yep. what's the latest, uh, you know, um, what is it, uh, Y game or whatever. So yep. it's different, but it's, uh, it's great to see the, uh, the idea of recycling and building stuff and That's using it. the imagination coming back. Yep. Okay, thanks very much. My pleasure, thanks. It's all about taking old waste things and making something new good. Cool, very cool. Hello, uh, 
I'm Peter from a podcast called Animal Logic. Hi, uh, Peter. G'day. Uh, g'day. You the main child? I'm Gregory, and this yep. is Michael. Yep. Michael, nice hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you, uh, you've got here. Okay, so we've got a found object lamp. Um, you can make a, object out, a lamp out of any found objects, but this simple concept here takes advantage of two commonly discarded objects. There's glass pendants, yep. globes, uh, and tea bowls. Mm -hmm. And it's like they were meant to be together, but if you go to op shops and tip shops and second-hand stores, you'll quick find this for a dollar each, usually. Yep. Um, and they go together so well that if you get a lamp holder, it can be a batten mount one or these simple um, screw screw in ones yep. and they'll go together really beautifully and quickly and with just two screws to attach inside there when you want to screw it it uh, it all goes together really beautifully and quickly it makes a beautiful bedside lamp. It does indeed, yeah. Where would um, the the whole the, the lamp holder or the, the bit which goes through the middle there, where do you get these from? We uh, have found, we found the uh, the national supplier who supply uh, lead lighting stores. Mm -hmm or you can poach them off an existing lamp, yep. um, which uh, is good most of the time. Yep. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, we tend to, the challenge for us is to find everything secondhand, yep. um, which is basically heading for landfill, of it, except for bulbs themselves, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, do you have a website where you kind of... Uh, yes, it's called Lamp It Up. Lamping Up. Lamp It Up. Oh, Lamp It Up, L-A-M-P-I-T. You think, you think. Is it .com or .au? Uh, it's at Blogspot. We're, we're search engine optimised. Google it and it'll be number one here. Okay, and no number two. All right, well, and number three. Well, look, that's, uh, that's terrific. <laughs> Thank you so much. No You're worries. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, hi, uh, I'm uh, Peter from a podcast called Amateur Logic. Right. And uh, look, I uh, just uh, noticed you're just heading off. And, uh, uh, but to quickly, could you just give us a quick description of what this is about? Basically, it's do-it-yourself double glazing. Yep. So rather than spending a fortune for someone to come and do it for you, mm -hmm. you do all the work yourself. Is it easy? It's very easy. I've never done any glazing in my life, and I did my whole house kind of problem. Okay. So and we provide you with the proper double glazing unit, yep. which is four mil glass on each side, yep. argon in the middle, ten-year warranty. Take out the existing glass, pop that in, and it's all done. Okay, right. And uh, so, um, uh, the, uh, the idea is this is this to, uh, for insulation or sound thermal, proofing? Or? Thermal, the reason why I did it is for thermal performance, because yep. I was concerned about climate change and global warming. But you get the added benefits you've got um, noise reduction, or so probably reduces your noise a lot, um, stops condensation on your windows. Yep. And it makes the house more comfortable. Okay, right? do you have a website where people can go and check this out? Just Google DIY Double Glaze. DIY Double Glaze, Google that. Yep, and you'll find us there. Okay, look, thanks so much. No worries, thank you. Thanks, sir. Okay. Uh, hello, it's Peter here from uh, a vidcast called Amateur Logic. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what you're, uh, you're building or what you've got here today? Okay, um, we're, we're called uh, Gorilla Builders, I'm Bale and Andre. Hi, pleased to meet you. Um, G'day. Basically, we build, uh, at the moment, we're building shields for the... Uh, yeah, keep going, sorry, yep. Yeah, we're building shields for the uh, Arduino platform. Yep. So we've got three or four shields. Um, now a shield is, is like an add-on or a, a, an extra thing you add on to the basic board, isn't that's, it? That's right. You get the basic Arduino and on its own you can't do very much. So they came up with the concept of shields which allows you to extend the functionality. Okay, so this shield here, for example, is a uh, like a video display, is that right? Uh, LCD display, yeah. LCD display. So we, we just facilitate the LCD display with our shield, which... Yep. Uh, 
basically looks like, like this. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, we also provide uh, libraries. Andre is our chief software writer. Okay. Um, so we don't believe in just selling the hardware. We also build libraries to make it easier. Okay, that's great. What language is the Arduino programmed in? Uh, it's using. I have to ask uh, Andre, but it's um, Fermata, I think it is. It's something okay. like that. Yeah. So, uh, what, what, what language is the uh, the Arduino programmed in? Uh, I guess they've got their own um, the sketch. Yeah, they yeah, got concept of sketch. Sketch, okay, right. Yeah. But it's, it's like it's sea like it's. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, anyway, do, do you have a website that people can go to and uh, find out a bit more yeah, about? Yeah, just uh, gorillabuilders.com. Gorillabuilders.com. Yeah, yeah, builders with a Z. With a Z. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. Well, uh, hello there, I'm Peter from uh, a, vid a vidcast called Amateur Logic. Uh, just noticed this rather strange device hovering uh, uh, near to us. Uh, what, uh, sorry, and you are, sorry? Richard, Richard, Richard Cox. Pleased to meet you, Richard. Uh, what, pray tell, have you built? Okay, well, this is a blimp Duino, and it's an Arduino microprocessor-based autonomous aerial vehicle. Mm. And how it works is it's uh, electrically powered from a lithium polymer battery. Mm -hmm. uh, it has an ultrasound sensor that um, it's calibrating its altitude on and, yep. and changing the thrust to maintain an altitude. Okay, and so at it's the same about... time, it has north, south, east, west facing infrared LED sensors that are sensing that infrared transmitting beacon on the stool there, the orange stool. Mm -hmm. And so it's trying to maintain its altitude and at the same time fly towards the beacon and um, basically fly circles or figures of eight around the beacon. Yeah, being so light, I imagine all the wind currents in here must be blowing yeah. it around a bit. Even slight turbulence is a problem because it's really not very powerful because all mm -hmm. the components are very lightweight. Because this particular envelope will only lift 100 grams, so mm -hmm. that's the battery, the microprocessor, the motors, everything has to be 100 grams or less. I, I imagine that it, with a bit of refinement and uh, scaling up a little bit, uh, bigger motors and whatnot, this would be useful in a kind of like a fire situation? Yes, you could, could scale up this to have better penetration in a, a wind or work outside. Mm -hmm. But I think you probably wouldn't go for infrared sensor direction technology. You'd use GPS. Yep, no, yeah. that's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. And so are you a member of any of the hacker mobs? Or yes, uh, I'm a member of Edinburgh Hack Space, uh, a very new member. And, oh, uh, so you're from overseas then? Yeah, but I spend um, about half my time in Melbourne for family reasons as yep. well. So, okay. Um, and sure. this is my hobby. Really. Right. Does it? Do, yeah. Does Edinburgh have a um, hackspace? A, a hackspace, or a, a, does it have a maker fair? Yeah. Oh, I don't know about a maker fair, but it has. Uh, it has an active hackspace. Yeah. Well, they can always come down to ours. <laughs> Bit of a trip, though. But uh, yeah. no worries. Look, it's a fascinating device, and um, do you have a particular goal in mind with this that well, you I, want to? I've been talking to an artist um, um, uh, about using it in collaboration with a. Um, piece so maybe projecting yep. uh, onto it or mm -hmm. tracking it with a projector or trailing some kind of reflective thin material to make it part of an art installation visual art installation yeah I know um, some uh, I'm from the amateur radio community and we send yes. up weather balloons yes. so um, this kind of uh, autonomous um, management of, of a, a, a flying device uh, could be, the electronics, etc., could be quite handy um, for uh, you know uh, yeah. just uh, balancing and sort of keeping the balloons uh, from spinning a lot. So um, yeah. anyway, well, nice to meet you, and uh, thank you, thank you so much for answering a few questions. My pleasure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Cheers. Segway, obviously. Inside, we've got it's based on an electric wheelchair chassis. So, the motor frame and wheel box here and wheel were a, an electric wheelchair. There's an accelerometer and a gyroscope here. A micro controller, which oh, under my finger there, it's an Atmel 18 Mega 16. 
Tazi um, and the motor control board at the bottom. The goal of the software and the microcontroller is to keep it upright, keep, it, keep the platform horizontal. That's all it does. And so, it's not going to wander off. Um, so that's the person trying to keep the platform control more or less horizontal. And so, in order to make it go, you simply lean forward and it goes forward. And it goes back because the platform the software just wants to stay horizontal and the motion is supposed to just to come back. What is the joystick here just turns it on the back wheels. So after the other wheel goes slower, it's the same now. You want to make it tell. Take that approach in, man. If we're going to be building it everywhere. It's documented online, and all the, all the firmware, all the electronics is there. That's not good. We just got to put it together. <laughs> and keep grandma out of it. That's pretty awesome. Well, it's been a great mini maker fair, and uh, I have to say it looks like it's been an unqualified success. And uh, look, I hope they, they run again next year. Lots of people attending, even at this late stage. Uh, they're closing in about half an hour and it's still full of people, so uh, that's great. So thanks to the organisers of the Mini Maker Fair and to uh, everybody that appeared on camera. Cheers.